Welcome to the Pathophysiology of Congestive Heart Failure. My name is David Woodruff. Let's get started and learn a little bit more about how heart failure affects the patient's body. In this slide, we're showing the process by which that myocardial injury will result in the patient developing a decrease in decline in cardiac function. So first of all, we see a fall in left ventricular performance followed by the stimulation of these compensatory mechanisms, the sympathetic nervous system, the renin-angiotensin system, and aldosterone. The sympathetic nervous system is going to stimulate the myocardium and cause an increase in the patient's heart rate. It also causes vasoconstriction along with the renin-angiotensin system. Lastly, the aldosterone system is going to cause sodium and water retention. Now think about this again. If we have a myocardium that is injured and we already have a decrease in our left ventricular performance, are these things really going to help? So the myocardial stimulation is going to tell the heart to beat harder and faster. Well, don't you think it would have if it could have? That's probably not going to be very helpful. The vasoconstriction is like clamping the tubing here, so it's going to make it harder for the heart to pump. Lastly, the aldosterone system is going to tell the kidneys to hang on to fluid. Well, the heart can't pump the fluid it has. What's it going to do with more fluid? So what ends up happening is these compensatory mechanisms actually cause more secondary decline and damage. This diagram is showing the normal circulation in the body. On the left-hand side of your screen, you see the right side of the heart going through and pumping blood to the lungs, then to the left side of the heart, and then back through the systemic circulation and back to the right. So let's plug in some of the stuff that's happening here in heart failure. First of all, we have a weak pumping action of the ventricle. That then is going to lead to fluid backing up into the lung, which causes some of the symptoms we see. So we're going to see pulmonary edema in patients who have left ventricular heart failure. The alveolus starts to fill up with fluid. There we start to get our rowels. There we start to get our hypoxemia and so on. Fluid then backs up to the right side of the heart and through the right side of the heart, and then we end up having systemic edema as well. So you see how we started out just having the left ventricle failing, and now we're backing up through the entire systemic system as a result of that left ventricular failure. In fact, most of the right ventricular failure that you will see clinically is going to be the result of left ventricular failure backing up like this, which we would call biventricular failure. Again, we're starting with our diagram here. Now we're going to plug in some of the components that we're going to need to manipulate in order to be able to help this person who has heart failure. So when we're not pumping adequately, one of the first things we're going to see is that we have an increase in the amount of preload. Preload is the amount of fluid coming to the heart. So if the heart's not pumping it, then the amount of fluid coming to the heart or the volume and the pressure of fluid coming to the heart is going to increase. So the preload on both sides, it's going to start on the left side in most cases and then back up into the right side. The other component that we're going to have that can be a problem is our cardiac output. Now usually we're starting with a defect of cardiac output which is causing our increase in preload. The third component of our hemodynamics that's going to be affected is our afterload and afterload is the resistance that the heart has to pump against. Because of our compensatory mechanisms, we're going to have vasoconstriction occurring as a result of the sympathetic nervous system and the renin angiotensin system. That will increase our afterload and put more pressure back on the heart and increase the workload of the heart even more. One of the components or one of the areas we're particularly concerned about is this area on the left here, and that's called the venous capacitance system. So when we treat our patients with heart failure, we're going to try to do some treatment of that venous capacitance system. Why it says 70% there is because 70% of your circulating volume is contained in the venous capacitance system. So we want to manipulate that so it contains more and less blood comes back to the heart. Now that may seem kind of counterintuitive if we're saying, okay, well, if the, heart, if the cardiac output is low and the patient with heart failure, then why would we want to decrease the amount of fluid coming to the heart? Well, the heart is already overwhelmed with the fluid it's getting. How these hemodynamic parameters are going to 
correlate with our clinical assessment is going to be as such. So our preload is going to be measured by our CVP, our central venous pressure, and our pulmonary artery occlusive pressure. The pulmonary artery occlusive pressure is the amount of pressure on the left side of the heart, and the CVP is the preload on the right side of the heart. We can also assess the, right, the preload of the right side of the heart by looking at the patient's intake and output, their daily weights. We can look for tenting of skin showing dehydration or edema that's showing that the patient may have fluid overload. Now remember that systemic changes and that may not directly affect or may not directly correlate back with an acute change in the patient's cardiac output. On the left side of the heart, the amount of fluid coming into the left side is going to back up and be called a pulmonary artery occlusive pressure. We're going to be able to correlate that with our clinical assessment by looking at the lung sounds, especially assessing for RALS, and then assessing for an increase in respiratory rate associated with subjective dyspnea. Our pump performance, otherwise called our cardiac output, can be assessed on the right-hand side of the heart by looking at a pulmonary artery pressure or on the left-hand side by looking at our cardiac output. If we don't have an invasive type of technology to be able to evaluate our cardiac output, we can also evaluate these components. If our patient has hypoxia, chances are great that we're going to have an increase in our pulmonary artery pressure. The reason for this is because we get vasoconstriction with hypoxia. If the patient has hypercapnia, a high CO2 level, we could expect to have a lowering of our pulmonary artery pressure because hypercapnia causes vasodilation. We can also validate our cardiac output by looking at our skin perfusion. So we're looking at skin color and temperature, etc., and maybe our capillary refill. We can look at organ perfusion, especially the organs that are very susceptible to changes in perfusion, like the brain and the kidneys. And lastly, we can evaluate our systolic blood pressure. Systolic blood pressure is a good reflection of our cardiac output, whereas our diastolic blood pressure is a better reflection of the vasculature. Lastly, to assess our afterload, which is the resistance the heart has to pump against, we can look at our pulmonary vascular resistance, and we can also look at our systemic vascular resistance. Our pulmonary vascular resistance, again, can be affected by hypoxemia and or hypercapnia, whereas our systemic vascular resistance is going to be reflected by looking at skin temperature and color, organ perfusion, but now our diastolic blood pressure. So diastolic is a better indicator of our vasculature, whereas systolic is a better indicator of our cardiac output. Some take-home points in the pathophysiology of heart failure include that heart failure is a progressive disease. We want to treat it appropriately. We want to block the compensation because compensation is constant and compensation makes it worse. We want to put our assessments that we're doing of our patients into hemodynamic terms so that we can better understand what's happening in the patient's heart and we can better understand how it would be best treated so as to try to prevent complications. Thank you for joining me for the pathophysiology of congestive heart failure. My name is David Woodruff and until next time, bye now.